Good morning readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and welcome to another bookish breakfast. I don't know why I can't get my camera high enough today, it's kind of a little bit weird. Um, you're just going to have to live without the top of my forehead. Um, so I'm here to do a little update on my Jane Austen July reading. I'm going to try and do it very very quickly because it's six o'clock and I need to leave for work in five ten minutes. Um, We'll see how that goes. Um, so, firstly, films, things that I've watched. I've watched the 1995 um, adaptation of Pride and Prejudice because, you know, I wanted to object to it. Um, then I watched uh, Becoming Jane, which is a film about Jane Austen's putative relationship with um, somebody called Mr. Lefroy, um, so that I could object to it even more. Um, my husband was not a massive fan of Becoming Jane. Uh, Persuasion is his least favourite Jane Austen novel and he said it was like watching three adaptations of Persuasion back to back. It wasn't great. I saw it when it first came out, I saw it in cinemas when I was quite young and I remember I found it quite enjoyable but really um, did find that it didn't it didn't sit very well with me, like it lacked a verisimilitude I suppose, didn't really fit with the character of Jane. Um, it was worse on a rewatch I would say. Um, <laughs> Then uh, the last couple of nights we've been watching Lost in Austin, which is a um, story about a modern woman who finds her way into the story of Pride and Prejudice and kind of swaps places with Elizabeth Bennet. Um, the start of that is, it, well, again, going with my husband's opinion, it started ridiculous and amusing, and as time went on, it got more ridiculous and less amusing. Um, it got a lot worse when it went completely off-piste from the novel and... They were just the same characters, but they were running around doing completely random things. Um, I could see what they were trying to do, but they didn't get it right. Also, I don't get why she wouldn't just put her hair up. Like, she would have fitted in a lot better if she hadn't constantly had this very visible modern haircut. I think they did it for comedy. At one point she says, I may be losing my sanity, but I can still do my hair. Uh, doesn't really explain how she brought her straightness through with her. Um, but yeah, that little thing... <laughs> bothered me a lot more. Also, there was no reason, like, things changed in the book because of the presence of this woman from the modern world who had appeared there, but they also changed things from the book itself for no reason, and that um, didn't really make much sense. So, on to reading. Um, I've read a couple more of Jane Austen's letters. Interestingly, I've just been re reading the ones that do mention um, Mr. Lefroy, so that kind of fitted in with Becoming Jane. Um, yeah, there's not really, that I can tell, a huge amount of basis in the letters for the things that happen in the film. But, oh well, the letters are continue to be quite, quite entertaining. I'd say it's not a gripping read, um, because it is just her day-to-day -day life, but just details of that can be quite um, interesting, I suppose. Then, um, what else? I've read a few more critics on Jane Austen. Um, there were some bits that I wanted to really pull out, but I've forgotten to bring them over with me, so um, let's just leave those for another day. Um, and then I have finished Mansfield Park, which I love. I love this book so much. I feel like every time I read it, it grows on me more. Um, this time I had it as an audiobook narrated by Francis. I'm going to say Barrett. I feel like every time I've said who it's narrated by, I've got the surname wrong. Starts B A R B B A R. Um, I just I just love it so much. Um, I'm not going to talk about it for too long now because, like I said, I've got some time constraints going on. Um, but yeah, I'm so delighted to have reread that this year. Then I have started Orgio e Prejuicio. <laughs> it's a very bad Spanish accent. Um, narrated by Marta Cruz because it was only like 73p on Audible. Um, so I've got as far as the just after the Netherfield. Uh, not the Netherfield ball, the um, the first ball, the very first assembly that they go to, um, which is so it's Pride and Prejudice in Spanish. Um, the narration is is okay. I can understand all of it. The only thing is she doesn't do any different voices for any of the characters, so I only know that it's Mr. Bennett switching to Mrs. Bennett speaking because I know what they're saying. Um, so I feel like it would be a little bit disorientating for a first time listener. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, this doesn't really fit with Jane Austen July, but we'll just ignore it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by how well I'm able to keep up with the story and how much I can still kind of enjoy the original sentiment. I Like, sometimes there's little bits of translation, like, she is tolerable, I suppose, but not handsome enough to tempt me. But in in Spanish, it's like, she's not too bad, he says, no está mal. It's like, it just doesn't feel like it's got the same impact. Um, what I was noticing while I was reading these books is sometimes how little Jane Austen tells us of a scene. So if you think about the assembly at Meryton, it's one of the 
really big inciting incidents of the book. Um, but we really just get a couple of sentences about it, a little um, encapsulation of the Darcy Bingley conversation, and then the rest of it is told in retrospect by Mrs. Bennet recounting the events. And that's a technique she uses quite a few times, and you feel like you've been present in that scene. You feel like you can imagine it. The people who um, turn it into adaptations obviously have enough material to um, create a script, although in the 2005 they obviously felt like they had to invent quite a lot more script um, with all these strange interactions that they had, um, but we'll just leave 2005 aside because it's bad. Um, but yeah, you haven't actually dwell on those scenes too long. And I think that contrasts fairly well with Belinda by Maria Edgeworth, which I'm holding upside down, um, where sometimes she spends a very long time um, delineating everything that happens in a scene and it, it just kind of it doesn't drag, but it, it takes a long time. So I think that's a real knack that Jane Austen has of just telling us exactly what we need to know and letting us fill in the gaps by ourselves without perhaps even realizing that we're doing it. So Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Can I attempt to perform some kind of review or discussion of this in five minutes? Let's give it a go. Um, so Belinda is about a young girl who um, enters into society, pretty much like a, a Catherine Morland type thing, um, a very classic setup for a novel at this time. Um, so we've seen similar things um, in Evelina, um, with Evelina Villas, I believe, or Self Control with um, Laura Montreville. Um, or Cecilia, um, also by Frances Burney. Um, it, it was just a, a very a amusing device, I suppose, was to take a young woman, normally from the country, normally with no experience of society, and then just throw her into London or Bath or some other public place like that um, and kind of see what would happen um, in the story. This story is a bit all over the place. Um, things happen, things like she goes to places, like all sorts of stuff happens, but Belinda doesn't really do anything. I think it was interesting to read this at the same time as Mansfield Park because they're both heroines who are the moral but passive centre of the story. But Fanny does a lot more, really, than Belinda does. But somehow it sometimes seems that Belinda does more. All she really does is advise people. Um, she's not a very engaging character and she doesn't have any flaws whatsoever, which... I always find um, makes it harder to interact with the character. Um, so I just wanted to quickly run through some of the other characters in the book, which who are a bit livelier than Belinda Portman is. Um, yeah, Belinda Portman really she does nothing. Like even amongst like perfect pious moral heroines of the time, um, Evelina stops a man from shooting from you know seizes pistols out of a man's hand. Laura Montreville grabs the reins of a runaway carriage. Like these heroines have some kind of agency and power, and Belinda really doesn't. But she does have some interesting um, figures alongside her in the book. So the first one that I wanted to mention is a character called Mrs. Harry, Mrs. Harriet Freak. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that her surname is Freak. Um, so this is a character who dresses as a man um, as frequently as they are able, um, refers to themselves as a boy at one stage. Um, she says, when I, she, when I was a schoolboy, and then corrects herself to schoolgirl. Um, they have very close female friendships. Um, they, they're married, but they are their relationships are kind of dominated by um, quite powerful relationships with other women, um, or with women. Um, and at one stage, they're threatened with being dunked in a duck pond because of dressing as a man, and this is being seen as very, very um, indelicate and improper. Um, so I found that to be a very interesting character. Harriet Freak is definitely represented as being a bad guy in this book, um, and there is this whole discussion about um, how, you know, she's it's, it's like delicacy and indelicacy, and um, Harriet Freak kind of says, I, delicacy is just a way of controlling women and, you know, I object to delicacy because delicacy prevents um, women from doing other things, I suppose. And another character, Mr. Percival, who is this very moral and upstanding character, um, kind of argues back delicacy, that delicacy is 
he, he supports female happiness and delicacy is conducive to female happiness. Um, to which Harriet Freak says, you know, I am for the rights of woman. Um, the, you know, the, and, and delicacy was a topic that was kind of covered in Mary Wollstonecraft's The Rights of Woman, um, which came out in 1792. So this was from 1801. So I found it really interesting to see how this book is in a way um, responding to some of those ideas, definitely speaking of them critically, um, but it just shows how um, maybe those thought processes were working their way through um, popular discourse at the time and, and seem to be thought to be impacting on maybe people's behaviour or people's way of life. Um, so I found Herrick Freak to be a very interesting character. Um, then I'm going to run out of time here. <laughs> in fact, I might just stop there. I might just stop there and I'll come back to some other characters in a, in a future video. Um, got to be pragmatic and get to work on time because that's an important thing. Thank you very much for watching. Um, let me know if you'd like to hear more about Belinda. Um, and yeah, take care, all the best and enjoy Jane Austen July.